It was a very, it was a big ship. Um, I think thirty six, thirty seven thousand tons, which was a big ship then. Um, so I wasn't. I wasn't overjoyed when I was uh, appointed to Repulse, but um, one it one soon settled into it, and uh, the ship was a very efficient ship. Uh, we had a, a, a very good captain, and uh, we got along. Uh, the captain was a man called Tennant, William Tennant, who was, I think, one of the finest, if not the finest, naval officer I'd ever met. He, he took some time to get to know, but when he did, he was a, a magnificent chap. Yes, uh, the repulse was uh, considered the ship. Uh, uh, how can I put it? It was the uh, uh, it was a, a really good appointment to join that ship, and you felt that you were above other ships in the fleet. A very very uh, uh, lucky ship, a very happy ship, and of course, when I joined it, all of them were time serving men. In other words, uh, uh, were career men. And it was I enjoyed it enormously. And uh, when it ultimately was sunk, it was it was a terrible loss, and uh, uh, it was something which we could never have entertained uh, that happening. Our captain, what uh, Captain Tennant, he later became I think a vice admiral or something, but, but he did serve on and survive the sinking, which again was unusual in those days. Uh, we were awfully pleased that he survived because he did a wonderful job as captain, but normally they went down with their ship. One of the reasons that we didn't uh, uh, get into some of the hotter spots, uh, such as the Mediterranean at that time, was our lack of anti-aircraft armament. So we were employed, we had high speed, we, 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 we had a speed equal to most of the, the big heavy German ships. And so we were employed in fleet duties and as the, um, the cover force for various um, sweeps, for instance, when the Scharnhorst and Neisner were out, uh, when any of the German heavy ships were out, uh, if an operation was um, ordered, for instance, to Iceland to capture a German weather station or on Jan Mayen Island or anything like that, then we acted always as a cover force. In other words, um, we were in the offing, uh, ready to give um, heavy gun support uh, when required. So we were always um, there or thereabouts, but uh, never actually had the good fortune to see uh, the enemy. For her age, she was the she was the most old-fashioned or the oldest ship from a point of view of of um, her anti-aircraft armament in the navy. And she was the last one. She was due for a major modernisation, but the war um, scuppered that. The close-range armament, cons uh, when I joined the ship, consisted of um, one, two, um, three um, multiple eight-barrelled pom-poms and I think two groups of um, four-barrel Vickers machine guns, and that was all the close-range armament consisted of. Uh, we, had, uh, we went and had a, 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 some new Ehrlichan 8mm close-range guns uh, fitted. We used to compete against other units in the fleet, and quite often, or more often than not, we would be the ones that would have very, very good results uh, and, and things like that. And we also had a very high speed, which means we could outrun the other. They were always holding us back because we could do about 31, 32 knots. And uh, we were very, very efficient. Uh, the one thing we were all apprehensive about was, unlike the battle cruiser Renown, which had been modified and had marvellous uh, air defence armament. We had not had time to have that done, or think, although I think it was uh, going to happen, but the war came too soon. And so our aircraft defences were very, very poor indeed. And, and we were sort of worried about it. And one could see, even in that early days, that aircraft would play a very uh, important part during the war. 
and in fact on the day war was declared we were at sea off Norway with the aircraft carrier Ark Royal and other major ships and were bombed on the day that war was declared uh, although uh, nobody was hit. We were terribly uh, 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 armed as regards aircraft and we've always, uh, I've always thought since that with the, the Admiralty knowing the armament of the repulse sending us out into a situation that was uh, building up that uh, it must have been absolute folly a terrible thing to do and, and, and really it was like sending a lamb to the slaughter The wars, well these were more the type of plane for operating in uh, heavy seas for landing because they were a float plane with floats on the wings and a hull like a, a ship's hull as opposed to the swordfish which was on two floats which were easily damaged in a rough sea. So the Woolworths was a more comfortable plane to fly because it had an enclosed cockpit and also uh, much easier for landing, much safer for landing. The two war wars which we took over were actually equipped with a new type of uh, radar which was called to air to surface radar and this was a new type of radar which had only recently been fitted to fleet air arm planes and eventually when we were in Singapore we were the only two planes in the Eastern Fleet who had these, this radar fitted Um, I suppose it was now the 30th of November 1941. We met the Prince of Wales at dawn in very rough seas. We might just as well have been in the North Atlantic. Um, a marvellous sight as she came sort of ploughing up here with her four destroyers and um, uh, great seas breaking over the top of her. And, uh, and um, the Admiral, Admiral Tom Phillips, was not flying his flag at that time. And uh, so our captain... Um, uh, acted in quite a controversial way, I'm told, by assuming command, as was his right as senior officer, and told the Prince of Wales to fall in the stern of us, which the Admiral's staff didn't take too kindly to, I gather. We thought that they didn't, the feeling in our ship was that they didn't put up a very good show, and, and that prevailed, and there was a, a wee bit of feeling out at Singapore when we got there and found that we had the Prince of Wales with us and that she was the one in charge. Well, that she wasn't a very good ship, wasn't very well trained. Uh, people said that, they, they, that she should have engaged the Bismarck and she got a bit of a shellacking and there was two of them and the Bismarck. And uh, th there was a certain feeling that uh, it, it's a rivalry which the Navy itself builds up between ships to encourage efficiency, uh, you know, with fleet regattas and racing and everything, even at uh, shooting and uh, night shooting, manoeuvring, all sorts of things like this. You compete against other ships to get there first, if you know what I mean. And um, this uh, feeling was that we were uh, not very lucky or, or, or we weren't very pleased at having her as a partner. It, there was that feeling that they hadn't done very well and, uh, and, and I still myself feel that, that, that they didn't put up a very good show and subsequently in the action which we're going to talk about they didn't put up a very good show there either. We arrived in Singapore I think on the 4th, 3rd or 4th of December uh, our first sort of taste of the East very very hot uh, we understood then that we were going to form part of the Far Eastern Fleet. Uh, we knew that things were beginning to warm up in the Far East. We knew the Japanese had occupied southern Indochina and things like that. When we arrived in Singapore, it was obviously a, a great, a great moment. The, 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 the tremendous sort of play in the media. You know, the, 
the fleet has arrived, even though the fleet, as we can see ourselves, only consisted of one new battleship and one old battle cruiser uh, destined for a refit, and four destroyers, two of whom were were in need of repairs, and uh, although there were ships scattered around that were meant to come in, uh, they weren't visible. There was one, one new cruiser in dock uh, doing repairs and a damaged destroyer from the Mediterranean being repaired. We couldn't see much in the way of war preparation. And uh, having come from the UK and home waters and, and, and uh, the edge of the Mediterranean where things were really happening, I think we were rather scathing about what we saw as war preparations. Everybody was told that uh, 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 probably for morale that um, the Japanese fleet was absolutely useless and that uh, it was just a lot of rice paper and string or, or you know that it was a walkover that we would go up there and we'd knock you know uh, knock them about and, uh, and, and cause havoc and, and this that and the other and it would be a walkover we'd really enjoy ourselves and this was the whole mentality and outlook at that time, at that particular time, when we were lying in the harbour with all the lights on, there was no hint of war or anything to happen, and everybody ashore was mining, dining, all the hotels and all the people and all the colonials we saw were all making merry and having a wonderful time. And it was just as though nothing was go going to happen, that the fleet had arrived and Japan would not now enter the war. I don't think we were thinking in the, the junior officer certainly. Um, I don't think we were thinking in terms of, of war against Japan. Although uh, I think there's a certain uh, always in the in the ships we had the silhouettes of enemy warships posted up in various places so that we knew what we were looking at. We suddenly saw them on the horizon, and um, the, and the first thing that went up between Colombo and Singapore were the silhouettes of all the major Japanese warships. And we knew that we were the only ships out there, uh, and so we thought, well, if it does come to something, there's no escaping action this time. We're going to have it, and, and you know, the sooner it comes, the better. So that morale, certainly in the repulse, was very high indeed. I think we thought there would probably be fairly um, tough chaps to tangle with, but certainly from a junior officer's point of view, and as it appears from some of the senior officers too, their opinion of the um, Japanese naval air force and and, uh, and the Japanese uh, aviation generally, and everybody was very conscious of the part that aviation was playing in modern war, uh, they were considered um, not to be very good. Uh, we didn't think that we were going there to fight a war. We thought that we would uh, go there to deter, and that was the whole object of them broadcasting that we were in fact coming, and that we had arrived. And then uh, suddenly, out of the blue, one night, Singapore was bombed. And of course that was the first horror, and the first surprise, and we came up on deck, and we saw all the explosions and that in and around the town. It was obvious to us then that the Japanese, uh, it had to be the Japanese, were bombing Singapore. And obviously they were after the two ships uh, that uh, had been broadcast as arriving in Singapore a, a few days uh, previously. We realised then that the Japanese were after us. About midnight or so, well it would have been the 8th I suppose, but anyway it was the night of the 7th, 8th. Suddenly the um, air raid warning red came through and we heard the sirens in the dockyard going and uh, the moment uh, this air raid warning red went, all the lights went up to full brilliancy. Everywhere. Uh, so everybody sort of gave a ho hollow laugh and of course we'd all rushed up all out of our bunks and camp beds and everything else and grabbed a tin hat and a gas mask and one thing or another and rushed up to our repel aircraft positions. And I went up to my... I was on the port, multiple pom-pom. There was one pom-pom to port, one to starboard, one aft. And uh, I went up there and there was a complete hush all over the ship. 
Um, but just the odd command from the captains of the guns, um, you could hear the shells coming out of the ready-use lockers and sort of thumping on the deck. You could hear the training motors of the engine, of the... Um, of the guns uh, whirring round, but uh, a rather but n a silence really, apart from these noises off, and uh, and then the next thing we saw the searchlights um, fingering about the sky over the base, and then we saw ten or twelve um, aircraft very high caught in the searchlights, flying dead over the top of us. Um, the we all opened up. Um, Prince of Wales um, 525, tremendous sort of uh, flashes of flame from the, uh, the muzzles of the guns. Um, and um, they flew on, no bombs were dropped. They had already dropped their bombs on Singapore. As we, we heard it very vaguely in the distance. Um, then there was a broadcast by the commander over the ship's broadcast system to say that the Japanese Navy had attacked Pearl Harbor and that, um, as from this moment, we were at war with Japan. We then heard that Pearl Harbor had been badly uh, 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 bombed and the, and the American fleet attacked. We then realized that this was a moment in history, that America was obviously going to be, be in the war. Their fleet had been badly damaged. The Japanese aircraft uh, and carriers were the ones that had done it, uh, must have done it, it was obvious. And uh, we then realized also uh, that we were in a, in a war situation. And then uh, the captain came back and ordered us to raise steam for full speed by four o'clock were given. And so we knew we were going to do something. And at about five o'clock that night, the Prince of Wales um, left her berth and passed us, and uh, we, we were all fallen in then. And um, I can remember sort of you know, standing there, very hot, um, sun absolutely blazing down and um, very humid, and uh, the tremendous vibration of the pr propellers sort of shaking the whole ship as we turned at rest with one lot of engines going ahead and one lot going astern. We, the, there's always the ceremonial of two ships, uh, two warships when they pass each other. Um, the junior ship always sounds the still um, to the senior ship as a mark of respect and um, of course Prince of Wales had the Admiral on board and so uh, the bugles went and everybody stood to attention and um, and she answered and then, uh, then then we picked up our speed and we went off down the Johor Straits. From that moment on everything emanated from the Prince of Wales. Uh, she was a modern ship and of course we did know although we thought that the Prince of Wales was uh, not all that it could have been, we did have a very modern battleship with us, so uh, we did feel fairly strong. But again, uh, uh, we, we all thought we should have had an aircraft carrier. Uh, the people in higher places must have realized there should have been an aircraft carrier there, uh, which had made all the difference, because the whole... Uh, gist of everything all the way through the operation involving these ships was that there was no aircraft of our own. Well, we, we sailed um, in the evening of the 8th. I, I felt that was wrong at the time, sailing like we did, because we sailed out of Singapore, flags waving, and it was as if we were going out to a big exercise, you know, rather than, than to sort of trail your coattails looking for the enemy. <laughs> we we seem to have um, we seem to have forgotten that, that stealth was the name of the game in the Atlantic. So you left at night, or as or as quietly as you possibly could. But but we went out with band playing everything, you know, what didn't seem right because. The world and <laughs> everybody knew that we were leaving, because to leave Singapore Naval Base to get out to, out to the sea, I mean, you, you had to go down quite a long stretch of narrows. We sailed out, and the tactic as it was came over the, the Tannoys was that we were going to meet this Japanese battleship, is it the 
Kango, so I can't remember the name properly. I think it was a Kango. And it's Associated Ex Escorts. And we were going to meet and uh, fight it, you know, fight, fight this, this fleet, which was reported, if I remember correctly, it was reported of sailing, having sailed from Saigon. And apparently it it, um, it had some troop ships with it, with, with, with the fleet as well. And we, we were going to meet these people at dawn on the 9th and, and, um, and do battle. The captain had indicated, you know, we are, we are, we are off now to, um, to look for the Japanese. Uh, we're almost sure to run into to all sorts of things, so everybody be on your toes. He also expressed the opinion that this was going to be a fairly dodgy operation and that he fully expected one of the ships perhaps not to come back. He had also said that uh, there was little use staying in harbour anyway because uh, we would undoubtedly be found and bombed. But nevertheless, we were, we were off. Uh, we had four destroyers with us, um, only two of the ones that had come out with the, with the Prince of Wales. The other two were undergoing repairs, and so we had two very old destroyers, uh, First World War destroyers uh, with us, who couldn't really uh, go the whole way because they hadn't got the endurance. And we didn't know quite where we were going until we had a long message from the Admiral after we got to sea to say that we were going to intercept, the, that the army was very hard pressed in the north and uh, the, there were Japanese transports lying off the coast and uh, we were going to try and do a raid on those transports and uh, sink them all if we could and do what was within our power to help the army in this pretty desperate situation. As we understood it at that time, this was a high-speed raid to try and disrupt the landing by sinking the transport and all the troops that yet weren't ashore. We were told that we might possibly run into the old uh, Japanese battlecruiser Congo. And the Admiral said in his message that whatever action we ran into, he hoped to finish quickly. Uh, and to retire at high speed to, to get out of any possible air attacks. It was low visibility, very low visibility, monsoon, almost like the North Sea, very rough, horribly um, wet and muggy, clamped down. We were at action stations, steaming quite fast. Um, we went right out around the east of the Anambar Islands to escape minefields, and then north up the South China Sea, heading straight for the south tip of Indochina, and then which he hoped to um, get to a position where we could run into. Originally, it was Singora, further north on the uh, in Thailand, but it was changed later on that day to Kota Baru, where the, the uh, there was very fierce fighting, and already the two two forward airfields had been lost, and um, whichever brigade of the Lem Steve up there that was. Um, holding, were, were having a very tough time of it. In fact, they were, they were losing ground. Well, we were a cocky ship, we were. There's no doubt about that. We thought that we were the best in the Navy. We, we, we really did. We, we were... There was a feeling of excitement, you know, and um, there was a feeling of, of, this is what we've come here for. You know, we haven't come here to sort of pussyfoot around and, and uh, showing the flag here and showing the flag there and things like this. So, w we thought that we would show them. There is always fear. But um, we didn't fear that we would be beaten. <laughs> 